praise right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is no better place to be on Good Friday than in the house of the Lord, celebrating or commemorating the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the name of the Lord. There is no better place to be. I know a lot of people at work, a lot of people are doing other things, but there is no place. It is so exciting for me, Brother Kenneth, to be able to be here this today at noon, commemorating the death of my Savior for my salvation. Glory be to the Lamb of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let us stand and go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we bless you. We adore you. We honor you. We magnify your name. Oh, glory be to the Lamb of God. It's such a special day, Lord, to be able to come in your presence. We thank you, mighty God, because you kept us through the night and you woke us up this morning. And as we come today to commemorate your death, Father God, open our eyes, open our minds, so that we'll understand what this day is all about and what you did for us. Help us, mighty God, not to take it for granted. Everything else that is on our minds that is not like you, remove in the name of Jesus Christ so we can worship you today. We'll give you that which is due unto your name from our hearts because you said in your word that God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You said we should enter your gates with thanksgiving and enter your courts with praise. We thank you, God, and we praise you, mighty God, for sending your only son to die for us so we can live, we can have life. We thank you because we understand that it's your breath that we're breathing. Glory be to the Lamb of God. It is your breath that we're breathing. And your heart's desire is to have fellowship with us. Glory be to God to have relationship with us so that we can love you and serve you and obey you. Bless today, Father. Open the eyes of your people, Father, so we can see you high and lifted up. Have your way this morning in this service, today in this service, that you will be done with giving your praise in Jesus' name. Glory be to God. We're going to read a passage of scripture. Matthew chapter 26. Thank you, Lord. I'm not sure where I'm going, I'll, how much I'm going to read, but I'll start from verse 1. Matthew chapter 26, verse 1. Let us stand for the reading of God's word. We'll just read from the King James Version, so look on the overhead. And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man who is betrayed will be crucified. Jesus is called the Son of Man. He will be crucified. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtility and kill him. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. But they said, now when Jesus was in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, to what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she had wrought a good work upon me. For ye have, ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she had poured this oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also there shall 
also this that this woman has done be told for a memorial of her. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his words. Remain standing as we sing at, at the cross. I laugh and did my Savior bleed. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Alas, and did my Savior bleed and did my suffering die? Oh, would he devote that sacred head for such a word?
define that one for me? Do you all know that song? How many of you know it? Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Not on there? Thank you, mighty God. I'll sing one verse in the chorus. See that you all don't know it. There is. Let's not sing it. I don't have the voice like that. Glory be to God. I, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. Oh, one day when I was lost, he died on Calvary. I know it was the blood for me. It was the blood, oh yes, I know it was the blood, oh I know it was the blood for me. Yeah, one day when I was lost, he died upon the cross, and I know it was the blood for me. It was my Savior's blood. Yes, it was my Savior's blood. Hallelujah. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood of God. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Jesus, save me. There, Jesus, save 
the blood I know it was Facebook, 
stay tuned, stay focused, so you can be reminded of what today is all about. I got up this morning as I was meditating. I thought to myself, why is it called Good Friday? All of this that happened today, why is it called Good Friday? I'm not going there because I'm not even a speaker. But it's called Good Friday. And I'm glad you're here. Those of you who took time out to be here, focus. Keep your mind on the Lord because God is a good God. There's going to be some people that's going to be sharing on Jesus' last words on the cross. Not words, they're not really individual words, they're statements that he made on the cross. And I do hope today that you don't just say, I heard that before, but you will, it'll be a fresh revelation in 2022, what the Lord did on Calvary on Good Friday. So keep your mind on the Lord, get your Bibles. We do have Pastor Barry from Royal Oak, he's going to be doing the He's going to be doing the last, is it three or four? Three? <laughs> Blessed be the name of the Lord. We have Brother Kenneth. It's going to be the first one to share. We have Sister Darnette. And we have Brother Trayvon and Elder. So you know what number you, you have. Once you finish speaking, I'm going to be throwing some choruses in there, reminding us that we're still talking about the cross. We're still talking about the importance of today. So when you, once you're done, hopefully my throat will be okay. And hopefully Brother Stephen is not going to trip out because he's still at work. But um, we will just continue to remind us during this day of what Jesus Christ did for us. So we're going to, I'm going to ask us to stand with me as we pray as our first speaker comes forward. That's going to be Brother Kenneth. Father, we thank you again. Oh, God, it's such an honor, such a privilege that we can come before you today to commemorate your death. Lord, thank you on Calvary. I ask you in the name of Jesus Christ that you would minister like only you can. Let your will be work your purpose out. Father, we bless you. We honor your anoint each speaker, that they won't just hear what they feel or what they think, but they will hear your word, because they have already experienced it, and I pray that you'll anoint them with fresh anointing, and give you the praise right now, in the name of Jesus. Before Brother, you may be seated, before Brother Kenneth comes, I just want to share something I wish I could, I'm not going to go through my phone. But somebody, I've been talking to this young man who said that the, these are the people who are Israelites. You probably know where I'm going, but I'm not going to go into detail. These are the people, we are the Israelites, and everybody else, we are the only nation, and everybody else don't mean much. He gave me scriptures. And I gave him scriptures. And I gave him scriptures. And he gave me scriptures. I wasn't upset. I was giving him the word. And he was pulling out scriptures to me. And the last, come, let me get my phone. I'll tell you what he said to me at the last. Mighty God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. As a matter of fact, he kept telling me. He said, he said, Pastor Weissler, I really want to know the truth. Because more than likely I was taught wrong. And he kept saying that. And I kept giving him the word. And the last thing he said to me, would you be willing to meet with some of my members in a question and answer session. 
I need you to pray for me because some of you know who I'm talking about. I need you to pray, I mean, the people I'm talking about. Pray for me because God has led me to a place now where I can share the word. And he's going to give me the grace. This young man, he said, Pastor, I really do wish to understand. The Bible said, in all thy getting, get understanding. And I, I'm, he's texting me, and I'm texting him, but I'm feeling the Lord. The Lord is dealing with him. I said, God is able to touch you and open your eyes so you can see men like men and not men like trees. So we're going to be praying that God will have his way and that I can be a blessing, an instrument that God can use. Keep your mind on the Lord as Brother Kenneth comes at this time. Hallelujah. Bless your holy name. <coughs> Good afternoon, church. Good afternoon. Let me say to you, happy Good Friday. I say, happy Good Friday. You might ask the question, Brother Cox, why do you say happy Good Friday? Muhammad is dead. Buddha is dead. Confucius is confused, and he's gone. But my Savior, Jesus Christ, he lives. The angel said, he's not here. He's risen. That's the God I'm talking about. We have some speakers that are coming forth. I'm one of the first. And as Reverend Whitehill said, I, and I see it as an honor. Sometimes I wonder why I even I'm up here. But through Jesus Christ, I'm here. And we want God just to have his way. And um, we, we see here, if I can take you quickly, to um, a historical note. We're talking about Jesus Christ and his crucifixion. Let me take you back to April 33 A.D. Jesus is in the garden. And he um, is praying there. And the soldiers come upon him. That's the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders, and, and the Jewish princesses, and um, um, th their different ministers. They bound Jesus. They take Jesus to the judgment hall. And they said about Jesus that he said that he is the king of the Jews. This was the fault they said they found against him. But you know it was all a lie. He came before Pilate. Pilate is the governor of Jerusalem. He's the Roman governor. And he judges Jesus. He examined him. He talks to him. He, he looks him over well, as a judge would do. Yeah. And you know what he said. He said, I find no fault in this man. Yeah. The people said, what did the people say? Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. You look, Pilate, he knew, he knew he was a wise man in a sense because he knew they brought him there because of jealousy. It seems as if Jesus always seemed to have so much trouble with church people. <laughs> and you look and see, this is, of course, this was the Passover time. And it was an opportunity now, as the governor, Pilate, of that city, he had opportunity to let one person go, a prisoner go. Yeah. And who was this prisoner? Barabbas. 
Who is Barabbas? He is a, a thief, a murderer, yeah. an insurrectionist. Him and, uh, him and his little mob tried to overthrow the Roman governor and empire, and through that, he committed murder. It said in the Bible, he was a, a notorious criminal. So the, so the governor asked him, who do you want? Barabbas or Jesus to be let free? Crucify him. Crucify Jesus. It said in the Bible, Jesus went around what? Just doing good. His hands was clean. But as church people know, even when you do right, it might not work out so good. And you look and see, because of what the people said and because of fear, and so you know about politics, the fear that um, the governor had for the people who wanted, wanted him crucified, he gave him over to the people. But before he did it, because he knew that he was such an innocent man, before he, he did that, he had water come, and he washed his hands. He said, this man is an innocent man. I wash my hands of whatever you're going to do to him. But how many people know you can't use soap and water to wash away sin? I don't care how hard you, you can get in the tub and get in the shower. You can't wash it away. So that blood was on his hand, no, no matter how hard he washed. As the custom, when they said to crucify him, he went through a process. And in this process, this process is called via cruci. Somebody say that. Via cruci. That's, that is the path of sorrow. <laughs> Jesus is about to go on the road. He's about to, he, he's getting ready to walk a path that we can't walk. He's getting ready to walk a path that he came down from heaven to walk. And I say to you, Jesus had a destiny. What is your destiny? Are you just here to come open your Bible up on Sunday, close him up until next Sunday? He had his eyes on the prize. Many times you hear what Jesus said. I have to be about what? My father's business. When people get to talking that talk, he wasn't even hearing that. Because he had business to take care of. And he was on that path. Via Cruza. He was on that, 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 that path of sorrow and pain. A after he got the verdict, after the hands were washed, um, the Jewish um, leaders, they were happy. I'd imagine um, Barabbas, I'd imagine he was pretty happy. <laughs> after that, all that dirty he had did, that he's going to walk free. Everybody was happy. After that, the, 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 the soldiers took Jesus. They scourged him. A lot of you guys might not know what that meant. But before you get crucified, you are beaten. Jesus was beaten into an inch of his life. Quarts of blood was lost. Upon his head, as we know, was, was placed a crown of thorns. Those big, long thorns in his head, blood running all in his eyes. Um, he hadn't eaten for days. He hadn't slept. He hadn't had any water. You know how we are after a couple of ser on Sunday service, about an hour or two. We can't wait to get home to get something to eat. We have to stop at McDonald's or Church's Chicken because we're so hungry. But we know, as I said, God was thirsty. God was hungry. God hadn't bathed. God was 
They said he had been beat so bad you couldn't even recognize him. Via Cusa. He was on that path. The cross that, that, that he bore after that beating, you are to carry your cross to the place of skulls, cavalry. The cross weighed about 165 pounds. As he was walking with his cross, as I said before, he was in such terrible shape, as you could well imagine. As I said, when I say beaten, um, they would strip you naked, beat you about the shoulders and the back and the buttocks and the, um, and, and the, and the legs and the thighs until you bled within an inch of your life. So you know he wasn't in too good a shape. But as he was walking, trying to carry that cross, he couldn't, he couldn't take another step, as you could well imagine. And they had a man passing by throughout the country. His name was Simon. And Simon took his cross to Calvary. They stressed him high and separated him. Ran, ran the nails. They say the nails were from five inches to seven inches long through his, his um, feet and his legs. But he was on his destiny. He had something that he decided that he had to do, and he was doing it. Hallelujah. And you look and see, it's a saying that Martha Luther King said. You have not really lived until you have found something worth dying for. Amen. Let me say that again. Martha Luther King said, Junior said, you haven't really lived until you found something worth dying for. Amen. Have you found anything that you will go to death for? Have you found anything or anything that's so important that you will lay your life down for? Jesus did, and he was on, as he was on that cross. It says in, in Deuteronomy, those who, whoever is hung on a cross, God curses. That's in the Bible. As he's on that cross, God, it said, God, what, turned his head from him because he was accursed. Men hated him on that cross. You know, it's something else. Have anybody ever been accused of doing something that they didn't do? Have anybody here, has that ever happened to anybody here? It hurts, don't it? It hurts when somebody <laughs> accuses you of something that you didn't do let alone to be punished for something you didn't do. That makes it all, all the more worse. And as Jesus is up there, his mother, her sister, uh, um, the disciples, they're down there as he's up on the tree. He's brought shame on all. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a saying, you could, you know, don't bring shame on the family. You can do your mess, but don't, don't you bring no shame on the family. Now, his family is suffering. He's up on the cross naked, yeah. shame. The people are looking down up at him. Why don't you come off the cross? If you are, if you are who you say you are, if you do, we'll follow you. We know that's a lie. His disciples, um, they, they are viewing him. You know, is, is this what I've been following all these, ye all these years? And you see, and as he up there 
to speak these words that I, that, 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 that I was assigned to present. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So who is he talking about? He's talking about Pilate, right? He's talking about the Jewish leaders. He's talking about the soldiers. He's also talking about me and you, ain't he? Because every day we crucify Jesus with our sins and our iniquities and our lies. My question is, Jesus had a destiny. We're, we're not just here to take up space. One day, a tally is going to be taken. One day, it's going to be a judgment. What did you do to build the kingdom? Some people got a blank, a blank slate. What did you add to the kingdom? I say it so many times because I'm a man who believes in work. You go on that job. You work eight hours. You don't get on that job and go get you a seat somewhere because somebody watching you, ain't it? Somebody keeping tally. You ain't going to be there no eight hours, and you ain't going to be able to put a long list of things that you accomplished. And that's the same thing with Jesus Christ and the kingdom as we're here on this earth. What are you doing to build the kingdom up? And I don't think we are more like God than when we're able to forgive. It's hard when somebody takes your money or do something to you. It's hard to let it go. I think it's a God thing, personally, because it's hard for me to let something go. But you turn it over to God. Because what it says, it says in the Bible that the kingdom, people looking up at the sky, for pie in the sky and whatever else. But God said the kingdom of God has what? Come down. And it's within who? Within you. So if God is in you working, you can let some things go. And some people here need to let some things go so they can move on. And the only way we can really let it go, is God, as Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Now, if me and you or somebody else might have been on the cross and they had beat us up and did it. We, we might have said, your whole, fr your whole family is cursed. You know, tell them what we would have said on top of the cross. But what did Jesus say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that needs to be our attitude, forgiveness, to let some things go. God said he really can't work until you are able to let, let it go. And I say, it's hard. But because of the crisis in you, you're able to let it go. Not just, I forgive you, <laughs> but I'm watching you. But I forgive you. Um, God said, he said, you know, I'll be the avenger. I will, you know, I will take revenge. I'll clear up the matter. Now, what we do, we take the matter, and we clear it up. We cut somebody out, we fight them, whatever. But God said, then God, he steps back. But as, as we turn it over to him, he'll clear it up. Have anybody ever seen God clear something up? When he clears it up, your hands don't even get dirty. Because you know if you clear it up, your hands going to get dirty. Your mouth going to get dirty. It is no doubt about it. So, we see the destiny of Christ Jesus. What a great God we serve that can stand on the cross and take that abuse, take the lies, and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What a mighty God. That's why I started off with Buddha, <laughs> Krishna. All of them is in the graves, and they wouldn't let nothing go. But our Savior did. The next speaker um, is an honor. Speak the words of Christ Jesus. Where would we be as Christians without the cross? Could somebody please answer that question? 
as I say, all them other people, you can go look at their DNA. The grave is empty. That's the God we serve. God bless you. And our next speaker um, will be coming up. I don't know if Reverend Huff's wife is going to announce nicely, but next speaker is coming up, Sister Donette. Um, true woman of God. And we, we welcome her. We welcome her here. We just want God to have his way. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. I'm just so happy to be here in God's house. Now, Pastor says she's going to sing in between. She knows I'm a singer, so I'm going to sing. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. If you know it, sing it with me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. You might say, Sister Donna, this is a kiddie song. Why are you singing a, a kiddie song? No, it's not. That song was talking about the love of Jesus for each and every one of us. Jesus loves me and he loves you. And I'm going to talk about what Jesus did through his love. Amen? Amen. 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 And I do, I did bring some children with me. They wanted to come to church. So I am so excited to be here with children. I don't know who I'm carrying. Maybe the next pastor of this church. Maybe the next president of the United States. Maybe the next mayor of this city. Maybe if you have children, your future son-in-law, your future daughter-in-law, I don't know. So I count it a privilege every time I pick up somebody for church because I don't know who, who I have. Hallelujah. 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 Well, I'm going to do the second word. As I was, I don't, um, this is not my thing. Uh, we have people, uh, we have some great speakers so I am humbled. We have Pastor Barry. <laughs> He's a great speaker. Brother Trayvon, great speaker. Brother Kenneth, who don't like to speak. If you listen closely, he does make some sense, if you listen to him closely. We have Elder. We have Pastor Whitehill. We have some great speakers in the house. So I, I am humbled to be here to speak a little bit. I am speaking out of Luke, and it was interesting Luke is one of the Gospels, and it talks about the life of Jesus. But Luke is the only physician out of all the Gospels that I'm reading. So he's going to be, he's speaking, and his, I'm sorry, not he's speaking, but his writing is from a perspective as a physician. A lot of times when you hear different people speaking, like pastor, a lot of times when she's ministering, she uses that teacher. She has a teacher background. So if you notice, when she teaches, she teaches as a trained teacher in a secular world. When Elder is ministering, when he, you notice he talks about the military, he's been in the military, okay? So he speaks from a military perspective. 
sometimes when you're listening to Brother Kenneth, he's a, a social worker. So, so people are ministering. Now, what am I ministering? In what perspective am I ministering from? Somebody that was raised up in the city of Detroit with a Jamaican mama and daddy. Amen. So I know about the streets, but I'm also an educated woman. I do have a degree, but I'm, and, and I'm ministering as a woman. A lot of times when m people are ministering, they can only go from, you know, the gender perspective. You know, I don't know what it's like to be a man. I am not a man. My family, my brothers, I'm not going to tell you which one said I messed up the set when I was born because there was three brothers and me, but I'm the one that made my, my mother's family complete because I'm... <laughs> I'm her only daughter, but to God be the glory. But so we have to, so we have to look at that. So, so I was looking as I was studying. I was looking at my notes. Matthew, he, they said he was a tax collector according to my studies. Um, they talked about Mark. Mark doesn't give the detail. He doesn't give the history, like, um, like when you look in the other gospels. And Luke is coming from the perspective of a physician. And John was the beloved, so I guess that's that's what his boy, his homie, his, I don't know, but they call him John the beloved, amen. So these are just so different different gospels, and it's written from different views. So that's so that's where we're gonna go from. So I want you, if you can, get your Bibles and let's go to Luke 23. And I'm gonna start from verse because here's a conversation going on here. There's a, a dialogue here. So let's go to 39. I hear pages turning. Okay. All right. So verse 39 says, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Let's go to the next verse. But the other answered and rebuked him, saying, Does that, does not thou fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? Let's go to 41. And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. Let's go to 42. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Let's go to 43. Now this is my verse, what I was assigned to do. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now, I'm not going to be before you long. Even though I'm long-winded, I promise you I will not be with you long today. As I was looking at this, now, interesting enough, I spoke on this last year, and I said, God, you know, what else can I see what, that you didn't show me from last year? Well, let's go to Romans. Well, no, we're not, we're not going to go there yet. Let, 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 let's talk about this man here. Now, he's on the cross. I know he's in pain. I mean, I don't know if anybody here has ever been stretched out and had things put in their bodies and, you know, for a period of time. But he was in pain. Everybody's looking at him. He knows that he's done wrong. Everybody's probably saying things to him, you know, you horrible person. You did this. You did that. But Jesus was right next to him. And he realizing who he was, a criminal that did wrong, and here he is next to Jesus, who he recognized in his pain who he was. A righteous man, a man that has not committed sin. Realizing he's, now, my thing is, how could this man see this when he's in pain? How could this man, but some way, somehow, it was revealed to him that this man is a right man. And as we see it, the conversation, there's a conversation going on between these two. The man realizing that he's, he, he's, he's wrong. The, the man realized that he's in his last few moments of his life. You know, I, a lot of times when people are on their deathbed, you know, they say, you know, if they were mean, they say, please forgive me. Or they say, you know, if they're with their families, please take care of so-and-so because they realize they're not going to be here anymore. But this man, he's, he's the last few breaths of his life. Recognize who, who, he, who he was recognizing Jesus, talking to Jesus. And Jesus responds in his pain. Today, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. What, 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 what should we see and what should we hear? What we should see, no matter what you're going through, 
as long as you have breath in your lungs, there's a chance. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how you messed up. As long as you have breath in your bodies. Now, God forbid, I hope that never happens to anyone that hears me. If they've left the Lord and, you know, they, they don't have a chance. But this particular man here, he had a chance. And he's talking to Jesus. And Jesus responds. Verily, I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. He didn't say, well, you know, you know, you did a lot of things. Mm -mm, I don't know. Mm -mm. He didn't say that. He said, today, today thou will be with me in paradise. That's awesome. Now, if you don't mind me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me step off a little bit. I've had people, you know, I've been in church for a long time. And people have said to me, Sister Garnett, you know, look, I'm embarrassed because they're out there, you know. Some people, I don't know what they're involved in, and, and it's, really, it's really none of my business. It's, it's be between them and the Lord. But no matter what, if you have breath in your lungs and you're in your right man, mind, you can come to God. Even if you, I don't know what the word sin is to some people. Everybody have their different you know, there's different sins, right? You know, you say, well, I told a little white lie. No, a lie is a lie. Whether it's white, black, purple, green, or purple, lie, a lie is a lie. It's still wrong. But no matter what you have done, no matter what you have done, if you are sincere in your heart, you can go to the Lord. Say, Lord, forgive me. And he will accept you. And he will not judge you. And he will not condemn you. You know, people look at you sideways. Like, for example, if, if, if word got out that I was doing some horrible things, like, I don't know, let's say I was, let's say, you know, let's say um, I, was a, I was just doing some bad things. Yeah, if I was doing some bad things, and people, oh, that's Sister Dawnette, she was doing that. Let me tell you something. Sister Dawnette, as long as I come to the Lord, now I'm not giving you the, you know, I'm not giving you the pastor to go out there and say, hey, you know, hey, I go out there party, you know, because I got a chance to come to the Lord. No, no, no. Some people might not get that chance. But going to the next scripture, which is not in this text, let's go to Romans 5, 19, 20, and 21. Romans 5. And this is so cool. That's why the Bible, I don't understand why people don't believe the Bible, because all this is connected. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so that by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Now let's go to verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Hallelujah. 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 I was trying to sing your grace and mercy, but pastor cut the song off. But I was singing that song because it's because of God's grace why I'm here. Hallelujah. It's because of God's grace why I'm here. So even though the man was, he sinned, he was, you know, the ultimate criminal, the ultimate thug. Grace much more did abound. Hallelujah. It doesn't say grace much abound. It said grace much more abound. Hallelujah. So where do you see that grace, Sister Dorney, when Jesus said today? Verily, verily, I say today you will be with me in paradise. That's their grace. Hallelujah. God's grace. God's grace. I'm going to sing a little bit even though I was cut, cut. But I'm going to sing just a little bit. Your grace and mercy, it brought me through. I'm living this moment because of you. And I want to thank you and praise you too. Your grace and mercy, it brought me through. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for your grace. Hallelujah. As messed up as that man was, he recognized who was next to him. And he talked to him. He said, will you remember me? He said, today. Today you will be with me in paradise. Hallelujah. So like I said, I wasn't going to be long, but I just give God thanks. I spoke on this last year, but God showed me something different. Where sin is, grace much more abound. 
Aleluia. Glória a Deus. Good afternoon, church. I was asked to speak on when Jesus on the cross, and he looked at his mother, he looked at John. I know it's one thing as we were having the service here, and I'm sure most of the people know there's a service going on. I noticed people walking back and forth, and what they were doing is they were going getting their food, and then they were leaving. And I was thinking, I was sad sometimes. We look at the things, the, cl the clothes, the food. We look at the materialistic things and things that are going to nourish our body, and we miss the spiritual. They could have come in, sat down, see what's going on, but they chose to take the food and go, and sometimes it happens when we don't have <coughs> spiritual eyes. We just look at the natural. In John 19, verse... 25 down to 27. Jesus on the cross, and like Brother Kenneth was saying, he was beat up pretty bad. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody, if their face was so bloated up, you couldn't even tell who they were. I had a friend of mine. He is, uh, when I was in Hartford, I just got saved, Hartford, Connecticut, and he was a roofer, and I mean commercial, like, you know, 25, 30 stories, 80 stories up. And he was up there working, and he was walking with a friend of his, and he said he was asked to go to a certain area on that floor. They, they were on, like, the, the top floor. And he looked at his friend. He says, you know, the Holy Spirit's telling me I, I shouldn't go there. The foreman came up to him. He says, you got a choice. You either go there or you go downstairs. You're fired. So the, the guy, okay. So he walked, bam, he fell through a hole, straight down, hit the pavement. They said when he hit the pavement, he bounced up about five feet. That's how hard he hit that pavement. He lived three days afterwards, and we got a chance to go to see him. And his face was so bloated, you couldn't even tell it was him. You could just about see his eyes. And this is somewhat what Jesus looked like. We need to understand the seriousness of what he went through for us. Beaten to a pulp. You ever got beaten to a pulp? You ever got beaten up so bad that you could hardly walk, that you couldn't even breathe? This is what Jesus went through. The, when they put the cross on his head, those spikes that went in, they went into his body. 
take something and poke yourself with it and see how bad it, it is. When they put that on Jesus, they left it on. They didn't take it off. They left it on there. We need to understand the seriousness of what he went through. He had just about breathed. They beat the living daylights out of him. And if you never experienced anything like that or seen somebody like that, you're not really going to know unless the Holy Spirit shows you that the pain and suffering he went through. Up above him was the angels. God the Father and the angels. And they were ready. If Jesus said, this is enough, I'm not taking any more, then the angels would have drawn their swords out, and that would have been it. The angels are looking. The people are looking. What's he going to do? Notice, one disciple stayed. The others booked out. They left as fast as they could go. How would you like to be on the cross? You're up there. The only thing holding you is the nails. It's not like they strapped him up there see, so he could brace himself. The nails were holding him up and his feet. And he's up there like this. And he's looking around. <coughs> Disciples are gone, except for John. John stayed. And he was g seeing what was going to happen. Next to John was Mary. And then Mary's sister. And they stayed. And that's something to say about, you know, how mother... To lay her life down for her children. And she stayed and was up there. I don't know how audible Jesus could talk. When you got your face beat up and your body beat up, that's pretty bad. And that you just about can make words out. But yet Jesus, in all this that he was going through, he took care of business. He took care of business first. Even though he was suffering, even though he was in pain, even though he could see the Father, the angels up there, he could see everything, but yet he was still in human form, and he took the suffering that was there. But during this, he was able to look and say, I need to take care of my mother. Why? Because he was the oldest child. He was the oldest child. Jesus came first, and then the siblings came later. Therefore, he was responsible to take care of his family. That was his responsibility. Not welfare, not the state, not the city. It was his responsibility to take care of that family. And he looked down there. Okay, verse 25, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. Remember, he's doing this through a lot of pain. A lot of probably, I don't know if the words were, well, th they were negotiable because they could hear him. But he was suffering a lot. He's got this guy yelling at him. He's got this guy yelling at him. Remember, the thief that got saved before that, he was on Jesus too. He was complaining to Jesus also. You know, if you think you're great, get off the cross. He's looking at that. He's dealing with the people down there. He's dealing with his disciples leaving him. And on top of that, He's, he's dealing with God turning his back on him. So even though he did that, he said, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. He just automatically took her in. He said, that, that's just the way it goes. And he took the mother in of Jesus. And what amazes me is that he was able, during all this stuff, instead of worrying about himself, he was concerned that everything was in order. And he looked at John, now you take care of my mother, looked at the mother, John's going to take care of you. That cemented, and the people were still there, the disciples were still, people were still looking for him, and John stayed right there. And I think that's one of the reasons God said he loved John. And out of all the disciples, John's the only one that died a natural death. He just rolled 
and one day he just passed away. He didn't, he suffered a little bit, but God protected him, but he wasn't beheaded. He wasn't sawn in two, speared or whatever. He just went on to go a natural death. So when we, when I look at this, I think of all that he did, he still had in his head what he was going to do as far as the thing of, you know, taking care of business, seeing what everybody else is doing. He was able to still keep his mind focused. Do we owe Jesus a lot? Yes, we do. We owe him everything. How do we act sometimes? I had, uh, we had a person, we do a Bible study on uh, Monday and Tuesday, and one person that was on, he said, you know, I never realized what Jesus did. And he was listening to the Bible study and sharing. He said, I, I always just thought, well, Friday, Good Friday, Saturday, Sunday is Easter, and everything's fine. Let us remember what it cost Jesus. It cost him everything. It cost him every single thing, but yet he did it for us. So when we look at this and we look at our brothers and sisters that we remember, if it was not for the grace of God, I know I'd be right out there. I'd be out there looking for food. I'd be hanging out in pool halls. I'd be hanging out in strip clubs. I know that's what I do. You get money, you go out and drink. But for his, because of his grace and mercy, he carried us through. So that's my portion. He took care of everything before he left. Thank you. Oh, in the blood of the Lamb, that there is power, oh, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Oh, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. Good afternoon, everyone. Unlike everyone else, I plan to be brief. Uh, when Pastor first asked me to give the fourth word of Jesus, I'm not even going to tell you guys when she asked me, but <laughs> when she did ask me to give me the fourth word of Jesus, I was kind of confused because, you know, I'm, I've been a Christian for the longest, almost... 13 years now and you know by now I expect to know a lot of stuff about the Bible but when I started to look deeper into the fourth word of Jesus it's like I've read this scripture over and over and it's like I'm just now getting the understanding at this age of what it truly meant yeah. now stand with me as we read Matthew 27 verse 46 Hallelujah. this is where the fourth word of Jesus is taken from and it reads and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama, sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You may be seated. For those of you that don't know, David foreshadowed this statement in Psalms 22, verse 1. In Psalms 22, verse 1, he says, my God. My God, 
why hast thou forsaken me? Now, when I first read the scripture verse, I was honestly confused as to why Jesus, being the son of God, would ever have to utter these words out of his mouth. As he said, the, the criminal beside him, he could have came down at any time. He could have asked for a thousand angels to come down and fight this battle for him. But he didn't. And instead of doing that, he uttered, my God, my God, why is thou forsaken me? Surely he knew it was his destiny to die for us so that we may have eternal life. Well, for many years, all of us, we just skim over this verse without trying to get the full understanding of what this verse really means. Jesus wasn't just uttering these words because of the physical pain he was feeling with his hands and feet being pierced by massive nails on a cross. Jesus cried out because he was experiencing something way worse than physical pain. He was truly abandoned by his father. Because he took all of humanity's sin upon himself, he no longer had that perfect connection to God that he always had. He could no longer dwell with the Lord because God separates himself from sin. That divine fellowship he had with his father was now disrupted and corrupted by evil, leaving Jesus in complete agony. He was not only an innocent sufferer, but now he, know, he knew what it really meant to be rejected by his father. As I continued to dig deeper, I realized what was truly happening. Jesus, in this moment, is literally living by faith. This is because he was fully aware that his father and his Lord was no longer with him, and he could no longer feel the father's love and care. But yet he still cried out and prayed to him, saying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus, in his darkest hour, no longer had any evidence that God still cared for him and still loved him. But yet he still had enough faith to pray to him. I don't know about you guys, but I go through way less and I start questioning stuff like, you know, I might not get what I want for my birthday or, you know, the gas prices go up. And I'm talking about God, where are you? I'm like, I need gas to be 349 again. Where are you? It's like. We go through way less, and or faith just wavers as so, as it wavers due to what we're going through. But Jesus is literally on his deathbed, except he doesn't have the courtesy of laying down. He's being hung up. So he's literally standing there. Well, I can't use that word. He's literally hanging there, you know, dying as he's speaking. The more he's speaking, is the more he's dying. And in the midst of all of that, he still had just enough faith to still pray to God, just to just so we can keep that in our spirit. He knew that what he was feeling was not really the full truth, as he still truly believed that God would still be faithful to him. As I said, I will be very brief. So before I conclude, I want us all to really realize what God really sacrificed so that we would all have a chance to spend eternity with him. He abandoned his own son so that none of us would ever have to be abandoned. Many of us know this scripture, John 3, verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The depths of his love for us is boundless. And because it was boundless, he gave the only thing that he had to himself just so we could all have the chance to be with him. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, it says, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus being the perfect model for the Christian should be, Jesus being a perfect person, as a matter of fact, no sin in him whatsoever. He took our judgment. He took our condemnation. He took our sinfulness. He took our disobedience. And he took our rebellion. He took all of that, put it together put in a backpack and put it on himself and then he died so that we may have eternal life Thank you, Lord. there's no greater love and you can never prove to me that there is a greater love because none of like for instance all these parents that we have in here i'm pretty sure you would never give up your children for a random person jesus didn't know you he didn't know sister yolanda he didn't know brother kenneth 
I know he definitely did not know Brother Steven, especially the way Brother Steven be dressing. Though, or we'll give you guys an update on how he dresses for Easter. But the thing is, he never knew any of us. And it, it was his choice. God did not force him. God gave him, he showed him his will, he showed him his way, and he gave Jesus the choice. And in the midst of that, Jesus was crying out. Every chance that he got, he was crying out saying, God, if I don't have to do this, don't let me do it. But he still understood that, you know, this is his destiny. So he still went forth. So I'll read it again. Jesus took our judgment. He took her condemnation or sinfulness or disobedience and or rebellion. He put it on himself and died so that we may have eternal life through him. There is no greater love, and there will never be a greater love than this. My charge to you is that it's now up to us to take advantage of this love that God has for us and use it for something good. We need to use it and submit completely to God so that he did not give his son in vain and so that we may live eternally with him. Thank you. And pure, I'll measure less and strong. It shall forever more endure. The saints and angels' song. Revelation, what a mighty God we serve today. Glory be to God. Our last speaker is Pastor Barry from the Royal Oak Encounter Church. And we're so glad to have him with us today as our guest speaker. So we're going to hand over to him right now. So he can take us from here. God bless you, Pastor. Oh, precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow, no other found I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus, what can wash away my sins nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus singing oh is the flow that makes me white as snow <coughs> no other bounds I know nothing 
that with me one more time. working power in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, there is power, power, wonders working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Sing that with me. There is power, power, wondrous working power in the blood. Lamb. Oh, there is power, power, wondrous working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Oh, Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Oh, Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. Oh, Jesus, I'll never forget how you brought me out. Oh, Jesus, I'll never forget. No, no. How can I, how can I forget what you've done for me? Oh, how can I forget how you set me free? How can I forget how you brought me out? Oh, how can I forget? No, never. Oh, he's done so much for me. I cannot tell it all. Oh, I cannot tell it all. Oh, I cannot tell it all. Oh, he's done so much for me. Oh, I cannot tell it all. He has taken all my sin away. Let's say that again. Oh, he's done so much for me. Oh, I cannot tell it all. Oh, I cannot tell it all. Oh, I cannot tell it all. He has done so much for me. Lord, I cannot tell it all. He has taken all my sins away. Jesus, I never, Jesus, I never forget what you've done for me. Oh, Jesus, I never forget how you set me free. Oh, Jesus, I never forget how you brought me out. Oh, Jesus, I never forget. No, never. Come on and clap your hands and give God praise in this place. I don't know about you, but this is a good Friday. Hallelujah. 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 I heard somebody say that they hung him high, and they stretched him wide, and he hung his head for me, and he died. Is there anybody that's glad that Jesus died for you today? Is there anybody that's glad that Jesus hung his head and the locks of his shoulders for you? Can we give him glory today? Let us pray, God, we thank you. God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your kindness. For it is because of your mercy that we are not consumed. It is because of your unmerited favor. And God, we take this time and this space to give you glory and to give you praise. God, we worship you right now. We lift our hands. We thank you for the gift of your son that you gave. 
the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Now, Father, hide me behind your cross, that they not see me, that they not see me at all, but that they see you and that you be glorified in all we do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Somebody clap your hands and give God praise in the place. Giving honor to Pastor Whitehill and to Elder Whitehill and all of you, my father's children, are who are here. It is my honor to bring the last three words, the last three sayings of Christ. We don't intend to be before you long, but I, I put it into a message, and that message has, has three words. Everybody say these three words. These three words. These three words. These three words are important. This is the day that we commemorate the fact that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ came down in, in, in flesh. He can, became God incarnate, and he came down in a human body to be able to die for us. Aren't you glad that he came to die for you? that you couldn't do it yourself. You couldn't you didn't have the capacity to bear the weight of the world on your shoulders, but God beareth the weight of the world and the sins of the world on his shoulders and today we give him glory. We're going to go ahead and start with the first word starting at the book of John chapter 19 verse 28. And it simply reads this in, in the NIV. It says, "Later knowing that everything had been finished." Everybody say it's on the way. And so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. <laughs> now, I, I, I find, it, find it funny that, that John decides to portray Jesus in this way, for Jesus is not just saying he's thirsty just because he's thirsty, but because between that day, the 24-hour period, there had been over 20 prophecies that Jesus had fulfilled. And one of the prophecies comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 22, verse 15, and it says that my mouth is dried up like a post herd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth, and you lay me in dust to death. Yes, I get excited when I hear Jesus say, I am thirsty, not because my Lord is suffering, but I get excited because there is a loaded statement in those two words. You know, when you really have something to say, it doesn't take a whole lot of words to get out what you need to get out. And Jesus begins to look down and knowing that his time has come to an end, he starts to say, I am thirsty. And I find it interesting that he says this in the book of John. Why do I find it interesting in John? Because each of the gospel writers has their own take on who Jesus is. Is. We have three synoptic gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they all give an account of Jesus, and they are very similar. For Matthew portrays Jesus as Christ and as a coming king, and Mark portrays him as a servant, a suffering servant, and Luke portrays Jesus as a man. And if anybody would have said this, I would have thought that it would have been Luke because in this statement, we see the humanity humanity of Jesus. And I would have thought that Luke would have been the person that said that Jesus said, I thirst because he wanted us to know that Jesus was human. But John portrays Jesus as God. It is John that said that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word came down and became flesh and dwelt among men. When I hear Jesus say, I am thirsty, hallelujah, <coughs> I get excited. Because although I would have expected this phrase from Luke and not from John, seeing that John is the only disciple that's bold enough and brave enough to stay at the cross. I don't know if you realize it, but they are hanging their teacher. They are executing their teacher. And because they are associated with him, they have guilt by association. They are putting themselves in mortal danger by being around Jesus. I'll, oftentimes, we get mad at Peter because Peter... Peter denied Jesus, but what Peter realizes is if they realize that I'm with Jesus, I'm putting myself in mortal danger. But it is John, the, the one that the Bible says that Jesus loved, the one that laid back and reclined against him at the Last Supper. It is he who says, Jesus, I'm not going to leave you, and I'm not going to forsake you. Just like you stood by me, God, I'm going to stand by you. You stood by me in my weakest, and now as I see you, 
here dying on the cross. God, I'm not going to leave you. And because of this, John gets to see something. He gets to see two things. Not only has he seen Jesus' divinity, but he sees his humanity. Because Jesus says that I am thirsty. When I read this, I get excited. Why do I get excited? Because that statement shows me two things. Number one, it says that Jesus understands. Somebody said Jesus understands. I don't know if you really know what that means, but Jesus understands my human condition. Jesus understands what it's like to be hurting. Jesus understands what it's like to have sorrow. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says this, For we have not a high priest uh, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but he was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. I've come to speak to somebody who might feel like you're too messed up and you're too washed up for God to love you but I've come to tell you that nowhere ever that you go in life will you ever get to a place that Jesus doesn't understand where you are if you're troubled in your spirit Jesus understands if you're sick in your body Jesus understands if you're facing depression and pain and sadness Jesus understands he understands what it's like to be hung out all by himself while his friends walk away and leave him to die if you ever been a betrayed before. Good God Almighty, Jesus understands. Somebody say he understands. Uh, I'm so glad that we have a God that understands that when I'm going through and I feel like, uh, Stephen, that I'm all by myself, I can always remember that I have a God who knows what it's like to be, be alone. I have a God who knows what it's like to feel despair. I have a God that knows what it's like to look up in heaven and say, God, where are you? I can't feel you like I used to feel you. I don't know if you're here with me or not, but I'm going to trust you in it. Wait. Yeah. <coughs> Number one, not only do we understand from this statement that Jesus understands my human condition when I'm going through, but the number two reason I get excited about this statement is because he was thirsty so I could be satisfied. <laughs> Matthew 5 and 6 says this. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled. Somebody says shall. That is a promise. And when you look up the word righteousness, the Hebrew word and the Greek word there, there is a symbolism of a divine righteousness or a divine justice. It is a making right of something that is wrong. It is something that I could not do on my own. In other words, it is talking about justification, that Jesus is going to justify me just as if I have never sinned. Jesus is saying, you might be on drugs. <laughs> You might have come out of a bed that doesn't belong to you. But I tell you this, if you trust me and you want to get your life right, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I'm glad that Jesus was thirsty so I could be satisfied. He suffered because he needed me to come to him. He was bruised for my transgression. Hallelujah. Isaiah says in Isaiah 53, verse 5, hallelujah, <clears throat> but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes that we are healed. I don't know if you know it, but Jesus took what I should have took. He died the death that I should have died, and the day I give him glory, and I give him praise because he suffered so I wouldn't have to suffer. <coughs> he died so that I could live. Hallelujah. Number one, I get excited about the first word of Jesus in this scenario because I realize that I have a God who looked down through generations. I look, have a God that looked down through my messes and my mess ups and my hang ups. And I like this because Romans 5 and 8 says this, that God demonstrates or he commands his love to us that while we were yet sinners, somebody say yet sinners. I know you think that you're Holy Ghost filled and that you're fire baptized and that you're 
you don't do nothing wrong, but I've come to tell you that you are still yet a sinner saved by grace, that you still got some things that are wrong with you. You still got some attitudes that you need to get rid of. You still got some mindsets that need to be generated. But I've come to tell you, even as imperfect as we are, still while we were yet sinners, even before we had a mind to change, the Bible says Christ died. Hallelujah. <coughs> I don't know about you, but I've come to speak to somebody who feels like they're too gone beyond the pale, that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. Come on now, talk about it, Pastor. <coughs> when I was young, they used to say, he looked beyond my faults. And he saw my needs. I don't know if you know what that means. He looked beyond the fact that sometimes you might have a bad attitude. He looked beyond the fact that sometimes words come out of your mouth that shouldn't come out of your mouth. He looked beyond the fact that sometimes you get jealous when you shouldn't be jealous. He looked beyond the fact that you gossip sometimes when you shouldn't gossip. He looked beyond the fact that you're hateful sometimes when you shouldn't be hateful. He looked beyond the fact that you're proud and arrogant when you shouldn't be proud and arrogant and said, I'm going to love them in spite of, and nothing you can do will keep me from loving you. How did he love me? The Bible said that he stretched his arms, and he hung his head in the locks of his shoulders. Hallelujah. And as he began to hang his head in the locks of his shoulders, Jesus looked up, and it takes us to our second word, John chapter 19, verse 30. It said, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. Somebody say, it's over. <laughs> With that, he bowed his head, and he gave up the spirit. Now, if you look at these words just on their face, they don't seem as deep of a meaning, but you have to realize that when Jesus is speaking, and this is written, it is written in Greek, and they don't just use a regular word. Sometimes in our English language, words get lost on us. The Greeks have five different words for love, but we say, I love my husband, I love my wife, and then you say, I love my dog, and I love my cat. It's not, it's not, as, it's not as exact. We, we, we lose something in translation, so when we hear Jesus say, it is finished, we don't really get the real meaning of it, but the word here is tetelestai, te te and that word tetelestai is an accounting term and what it literally means is that the debt is settled which means that if you were in a deficit and you owe something that you couldn't pay that Jesus is saying that the transaction had now taken place what transaction is it Hebrews 9 and 22 lets us in on the transaction because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life I don't know if you know it but the death that Jesus died I deserve that death and the death that Jesus died you deserve that death but Hebrews 9 and 22 says how do we settle that debt how do we settle what we owe it says in Hebrews 9 and 22 it says that without the shedding of the blood there is no remission of sin. In other words, sin is so heinous in the eyes of God that it must be punished in the most brutal way. And that's why Jesus came and he died in the most brutal way. He died in the most shameful and the most embarrassing way because he's trying to show us what we really should have gotten. We got grace, which is really God's riches at Christ's expense, that Christ died for death, that we should die. And Jesus looks up to heaven heaven after he knows that he has accomplished all he has decided to accomplish uh, and I've looked and saw that Pilate couldn't stop him and Judas couldn't stop him and the Pharisees couldn't stop him and the Sadducees couldn't stop him and the Essenes couldn't stop him and Rome couldn't stop him and Jerusalem couldn't stop him and he looks up and he says huh, it is finished huh? the debt is settled I don't know if you know it today but somebody scream I'm debt free Hallelujah! <laughs> But, Pastor, I'm looking at my bank account. I'm looking at my credit card statement, and I'm not debt free. Yes, you are. You might have to pay a little money to the bank, but thanks be to God that you don't owe anything else for your soul. Your soul is already paid for, bought and paid for with the blood of Jesus Christ. <coughs> 
And after Jesus has paid the debt for our sins, after he has settled the debt and looked up and said to Tetelestai that it is finished, it is accomplished, which means that you don't have to do anything else. All you have to do is believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ. All you have to do, the Bible said that if thou believest in thy heart and confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and that God has raised him from the dead, I've come to tell you whether you're listening right there by the airways or whether you're listening in this room or whether you're listening coming down the streets of Detroit and listening to the speaker that's outside. I've come to tell you, you have never gotten so low that the blood of Jesus cannot reach you. All you have to do is save me. For John said that for they that call on the name of the Lord, there's not a debt might. He said they shall. Somebody say they shall. They shall be saved. Hallelujah. Jesus is once again quoting a psalm when he gets to his last words. <laughs> For in the book of Luke chapter 23, 46, Jesus, the Bible said that Jesus called out with a loud voice. <coughs> You would think by this time when Jesus is beaten to the point that he is unrecognizable. When Jesus, I don't really know if you know what crucifixion is, but that's where we get the word excruciating from the word crucify. In other words, that a pain is so unbearable that we can't bear it. Jesus had been whipped all night long. He had been beaten beyond recognition, carrying his cross, his cross beam as far as he could until a young man from Africa named Simon of Serene had to pick up the cross because Jesus had become too physically weak to do it for himself. Scourged and buck naked on the cross, leaning up with his hands there. And when your hands are in this position, he could not breathe. And the only way he could get a breath is every now and then against that old rugged cross to put his raw bloody back and scrub up, and up against the cross just to get a breath. Can you imagine hour after hour, minute after minute, second after second, struggling to breathe all the while while your lungs are filling with fluid, all the while while your body is in the middle of actively dying, all the while while your body is shutting down, all the while while strength is leaving your body every now and then. You have to get a breath, so you have to pull up on the nails. You have to rub on your back. Jesus is in an extremely painful situation. <clears throat> Jesus is suffering. But even in that, we see victory. We see our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I told Brother Lunny one day that one of my favorite things is a cartoon. And this really describes how I look at life. It's a cartoon, and there's a cartoon of a pelican. And inside of the mouth of the pelican, there is a frog on the inside. The pelican is eating the frog. But if you look around the beak of the pelican, you can see two scrawny little frog hands reaching out and grabbing around around his neck and what it's saying underneath is don't ever give up in other words just when you think I'm done I still got something left in me even though Jesus is suffering on the cross even though Jesus is suffering and dying and you would think he would not have anything left but Jesus is so on purpose and so on mission the Bible says he doesn't just cry but he cried with a loud voice somebody say a loud voice <laughs> he cried with a loud voice in other words to say I'm not going out with a whimper but I'm going out with a bang. I'm going out just like I'm coming back with all power in my hand. And he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. Why is that important? <laughs> because it indicates that Jesus knew the scripture. Jesus knows Psalms chapter 31, verse 1 through 5. The media team is quick back there. They've already put that on the screen. Never give up. Somebody said, never give up. <laughs> I've come to tell you that no matter where you are in life, you need to be like this. You need to never give up because when Jesus was on the cross, he never gave up on you. And when Jesus says this, he is quoting Psalms chapter 31, verse 1 through 5, where, J where David is talking about being and taking refuge in God. And David says he indicates that when he is weak, there is refuge in God. Let's go ahead and read that. Let's read that together. It says, in thee, O Lord, do I put 
put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Bow down thy ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock for an house and a defense to save me. Let's keep going. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, my name's sake, lead me and guide me. Good God Almighty, pull me out of the net that they have laid privily for me. For thou art my strength. Into thy hand I commit my spirit. Thou has redeemed me, O oh Lord my God. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is simply saying that I'm putting my trust, Father, in your hands. Why is that important? Because in this world, we vet everything. If anybody has children like I have, before you let somebody come sit your children who are your precious resource, you want to find out everything about the babysitter. You want to find out what kind of person are they. Are they crazy? Uh, do they like to do funny stuff? Why? Because you're entrusting resources. Before we put our money in a bank, Brother Kenneth, he's good with money. Or you look at an investment, we tend to shop around, don't we? And we decide if I'm going to leave my money with you if I'm going to leave my precious resource with you, that you are in good hands. I am in good hands when I give you my precious resource. Anything we love, we value, we only entrust it into hands that have the capacity to protect and to sustain. <coughs> So when I look at this, and I see that when it comes time for Jesus to give up his life, what we see Jesus saying, Father, it's in your hands. <coughs> Why do I need to know that today? Because when I was young, they used to sing a song. I don't know if you've heard it, but they used to always say, must Jesus bear huh, the cross alone and all this world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone, and there's a cross for me. <laughs> Whether you know it or not, there's a cross that we all <coughs> must bear. Hallelujah. And I, of course, that when we follow Jesus, I don't know if you know it, that although Jesus has already died, guess what? A call to follow Jesus is a call to death because you must die before you live. For I heard Luke say in Luke 9, 23, that if any man will come after me, he must first deny himself and pick up his cross and follow me daily. It's a call to give up the life that you knew for a life that never ends. Some might be hesitant to make the journey but I've come to tell you that if you put your trust in the hands of God, you won't worry about all state. I've come to tell you, you are in good hands with the Father. Huh? You are in good hands with Jesus. Huh? You are in good hands with the Holy Spirit. You are in good hands. Somebody say, I'm in good hands. You're in good hands because you're in the hands that he said that the devil in hell, if you're in my hands, cannot pluck you out of my hands. I've come to tell you that friends will throw you away. Family will throw you away. Your closest confidants will throw you away. But I've come to tell you that Jesus said, if you're in my hand, nobody can take you out of my hand. I hear him telling Israel, see how I've engraved your name in the palm of my hand. I have called your name in the palm of my hand. My hand. Those hands are the hands that stretched out and built the earth. Those are the hands that healed the sick. Those are the hands that raised the dead. Those are the hands that hung on the rugged cross. Those are the hands that have nails in them. Those are the hands that had blood protruded from them. And then I heard the songwriter say, there is a fountain filled with blood that's flowing from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood. They lose all of their guilty stain. <laughs> For these last three words that Jesus gives us, they prompt three words from us. <laughs> For these three words that I thirst. <laughs> from these three words that let us know that the debt is settled. <laughs> from these three words that he has entrusted it all to the Father. And the Bible says because he has done this, it says that he has been given the name that is above every name. <laughs> that at the name of Jesus, every knee. If you're walking by, I want you to hear that. That every knee. You might not bow today, but you're going to bow one of these days. You might think it's worth keeping walking, but if you can hear my voice right now, you can't keep living how you're living forever. One day, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess in heaven and earth and under the earth. <laughs> but these three words are important. But these three words that I'm about to give you are the most important that you will ever hear. <laughs> Everybody repeat after me. I, I surrender, surrender 
all. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't think you really got what I said. Somebody shout that again. I <laughs> surrender <laughs> all. <laughs> Say it one more time. Stand on your feet like you mean it and look up to heaven. And when you realize what he did, somebody shout, I, <laughs> I surrender all. <laughs> Lord, you can have my life. <laughs> you can have all of me. <laughs> I surrender it all to you, Jesus. <laughs> Save me. I need you. <laughs> Every hour, <laughs> I need you. Hallelujah. Oh, God, I surrender all. I hear the songwriter saying, all to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. I've come to tell you today that because Jesus died for you, you can surrender it all. Does anybody have anything in here that's troubling you? Does anybody have anything that you need to give to Jesus? Raise your hand if you have something that you need to give to God. And whatever request you have, look up to heaven and say, Lord, I surrender all. See, the problem is we come to these altars and we do a temporary surrender. We put it down and we pick it back up. But what Jesus is wanting us to do is lay it down and leave it there. Take your burdens to the foot of the cross and leave them there. These three words will change your life. These three words will make you brand new. I Surrender. Oh, you may be saved. You may know Jesus, but you're not yet going through a process of sanctification. And you still have some things in your life that you need to get rid of, some things that nobody else can see, but God sees. Say to Jesus, I surrender. Oh. Now, as we come here to the foot of the cross, this altar is open for anybody who needs it. And I, I'm pretty sure on a day like today, even if you're saved, sanctified, and Holy Spirit filled, you can come to this altar and say, God, I surrender it all. I surrender just not for the things that I know that I'm doing, but Lord, I'm sure there's some things that I've forgotten and some things that I'm not even aware of, Steve. You know, sometimes it's not the things that we know that get us. It's the things that we aren't aware of those unconfessed sins in our life, those unrepentant sins in our life. And God is saying to you today, listen to my last three words and give me those three words. If you don't know Jesus today, you can know him. God is saying to you, surrender. John, the disciple that Jesus loves, gives us a simple formula. He said, for those that call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, can we lift our hands and worship God if you're watching online right now where you are, if you're on your couch, if you're riding in your car, keep looking at the road, but begin to worship God right now. God is in this place. Stephen, can you feel him? I feel him. Hallelujah. The Bible says that where two or three are there gathered in my name as touching and agreeing, I will be in the midst. I don't know about you, but I feel the presence of God in this place. Can you just worship him for a few minutes? We worship you, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I surrender all. I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Come on, Danette. Oh, I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Just as I am without one plea, and that 
Thy blood was shed for me, and that Thou biddest me come to Thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I Hallelujah, 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 Lord. We come to you right now in the name of Jesus, thanking you for your love, thanking you for your sacrifice, thank you for your grace, thank you for your mercy, for it is because of your mercies that we are not consumed. Father, and I pray for those who are listening to the sound of my voice, will find a richness in your grace and in your love and in your mercy. God, you were bruised and broken to fix our brokenness. You were pierced for all our problems and our iniquities. Oh, God, all of our sins you bore on the cross. For about this time, God, they be taking you and placing you in a borrowed tomb. But, God, I'm so glad that the tomb wasn't temporary, but it was just borrowed. That God, you rose, Jesus, with all power in your hand. And I pray, Lord God, right now that your anointing will cover this message, all the speakers that have been speaking today, that somebody will listen to this live feed and this stream and in this room, and your word will germinate in our hearts and produce new life. In the name of Jesus, be pleased with us. May the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, our strength and our redeemer. In the mighty and in the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise in the place.
Hallelujah. Thank God for his worship. Let's just continue to worship for a little while. That's all right. Just worship. Hallelujah. 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 You're worthy, God. Thank God for his word today. Thank you, speakers. You did a great job, and I want you to continue to yield yourself to the Lord so you can continue to be a blessing to the local church and to others around. I want to thank Pastor Barry for coming. Powerful word, powerful word. He just came as an instrument. Thank you, Lord. We're going to, I know he didn't come looking for an offering, but we're going to give him a love offering. He doesn't come looking for that, but we are going to. He's our guest speaker. So we're going to ask, we're going to collect a love offering for him. So give us, the Lord blesses you as Brother Danny is doing that. We are going to Royal Oak tonight at seven o'clock so be ready to go thank you lord just be ready to go yes they're having we have 12 o'clock here they're having it at seven tonight so we're going to hear whoever is coming to speak we just go and join 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 them give as the lord blesses you Thank you, mighty God. Thank you, mighty God. Thank you, mighty God. Hallelujah. Sunday is our, it's Easter Sunday. Oh, come on out and, and um, invite someone. We're also, those of you who can make it here tomorrow at 11 o'clock, we're having uh, memorial service. Most of my, this person is not a member of the church, but because I am a chaplain, one of the officers from my precinct was at her house when her son passed away, and what they did is handed it over to me. So the, the memorial service is going to be here tomorrow. The body is going to be cremated. The memorial service is going to be here tomorrow. I told my commander Last night, he was the chaplain over us. I said, you go ahead and plan for the service. Uh, I, I, I just facilitate. So at 11 o'clock today, from 3 to 8 is the visiting hour. So I'm going to be going there when I leave here today and then leave from go to Royal Oak. So if you can make it here tomorrow, just for support, the mother is having a really, really hard time because the son just died. So... I've been encouraging her and she's been holding on and we want to do the best we can as far as supporting them. So like I said, my chaplain, chaplains will be here tomorrow and 
officers, police officers, them nice. Just come on and be with us if you can. Let us all stand. I'm going to bless the offering and we'll go into dismiss so we can go home and rest for seven o'clock service tonight. Father in heaven, we're just so, so grateful for this service. Thank you, mighty God, for your servants that you have used. Thank you, mighty God, for their yieldedness. Mighty God, we thank you for the anointing that destroyed yokes. Thank you, my God, that they realize we are reminded what you did for us on the cross. My God, you took our sins, you took our mess, you took our everything, and you nailed them to the cross. God, we're just so thankful. Because of that today, we surrender all to you. You surrendered, you gave your life, you were rejected, but you gave your life because we would not have life if you had not given yours. So tonight, today, we're thankful that you went to the cross so that we can have life and have it more abundantly. We thank you for the offering that has, has been collected. We ask your blessing for the use of, it can be used for the building of your kingdom. We give you praise right now in the name of Jesus. Glory be to God. You're dismissed. Take it with someone. Tell them you love them. Tell them you'll see them tonight at 7 o'clock.